It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope that all of you are doing well. If you have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you'll get in touch. Give me a call at 608-224-0274 or send a text to that number or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you and I'd be glad to get back with you if there's some way that we can help. We hope that you'll get in touch as well. But anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you'll let us know, especially before we get the bulletin out this coming Saturday afternoon. Remember that we are still planning on getting together for worship this coming Lord's Day morning at 9 a.m. And because of the high numbers of COVID right here in Madison and Dane County, we're still uh, limiting that to 9 o'clock right now instead of the 10.30 as well. But 9 o'clock a.m. is when we'll be getting together as a group, and we plan on recording that service and then replaying that uh, later in the morning. So if you, have, uh, if, if you have plans on joining us this coming Sunday at 9, make sure to sign up on the Sign Up Genius account. And if you have any trouble with that whatsoever, get in touch with me or with Kenna, and we'd be glad to connect you with that. If there's anything that we need to be praying about, though, please get in touch by giving me a call or sending an email. I am test driving a new live stream pulpit tonight. I think this might be version 4.0. Uh, the first was an angled stand for the desk in my office, and it worked okay for the first time or two, but I very quickly started rethinking that and did a complete overhaul with new materials and better angles. And then I realized that my filing cabinets were pretty boring as a background. I think uh, one of you might have referred to that as the dungeon. <laughs> and so I decided to move out into the garage in front of the wood pile. And so I set up something completely different out here. But the old setup out here involved two cases of uh, purple power windshield washer cleaner. That's kind of what everything was set up on out here in the garage. And that was very difficult to move. Uh, purple power windshield washer cleaner is heavy. I think each case has six gallons. So I had 12 gallons of windshield washer cleaner as my base out here. So this is a brand new setup that includes something for me to sit on as well as a shelf for the laptop itself. And then there is a clear plexiglass uh, shelf for my notes to go on so I can uh, see my notes and also be able to see the keyboard for when I uh, move from one screen to the other. Uh, Gary Mueller stopped by this past Monday afternoon and got to check it out in person uh, right after I finished it. I was still out here in the garage wrapping it up, but uh, this is an improvement, so we'll see where it goes from here. Uh, but it is much easier to move out of the way. That was my main goal in giving this upgrade so that hopefully we can get at least one of our cars in the garage as the winter moves in on us and uh, makes it a little bit easier to do that. So that is my good news for tonight, just a little bit of a different setup out here. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke, and our last study from Luke was way back on September 30th, so just over two months ago. You may remember that Josh then taught the book of Hebrews for three weeks as I was out visiting my sister in Washington State, and I'm thankful that he was able to teach in that way. And since then, we've been looking at some study guides to try to help get us ready and to train us and to give us some more tools for explaining the gospel to others. And so we've been doing that for about a month and a half now. But now we get back to the book of Luke. And so I hope it hasn't been too long. I hope you remember something from the book of Luke by way of review. We know that Luke is a Gentile, which makes him very unique among the authors of the four gospel accounts. He is also a medical doctor. Later in the New Testament, Paul will refer to Luke as the beloved physician. And so Luke was a medical doctor. We also know he writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. And so Luke we might describe as volume one, describing the life of Christ, and then Acts, we might describe as volume two, describing the growth of the early church. In the book of Luke, he makes a point of writing in chronological order. It is a well-researched account. He was not an eyewitness of the life of Jesus, but instead he talked to those who were. And he arranged those accounts in chronological order, making sure that everything was straight and organized in a way that we could understand it. And so Theophilus, we assume, was either some kind of a, a wealthy sponsor who made the book possible, maybe paid for Luke's time and his materials. Uh, writing books was expensive in those days. 
Uh, either that or Luke was writing to Theophilus as a potential convert to the Christian faith. And so uh, this was uh, like a document intended to uh, convince uh, Theophilus of the truth of the gospel message. So he makes a point of writing in chronological order. And in doing the book of Luke and in writing the book of Acts, he, he includes a number of people who were often overlooked and sometimes neglected or oppressed in the ancient world. Women and widows and Gentiles and Samaritans and other foreigners, as we might say, outside of the Jewish circle of friends. And he includes a number of the sick and also those who were poor. And he emphasizes them in a way that lifts them up and brings them honor. And so if you were in one of those categories, Luke has a way of appealing to you. We left off two months ago, right as we started looking at the last week of the Lord's life. The last week, right before the crucifixion, sometimes people will refer to that as the Passion Week, the week of the Lord's suffering. And so that's where we left off two months ago. And in that last class back on September 30th, we had the parable of the nobleman and the minas. And the nobleman was that guy who leaves town to receive a kingdom. And on his way out of town, he leaves one mina with each of his 10 servants. And when he finally gets back, he demands an accounting. And one servant has turned his one mina into 10. He has uh, that man is then given 10 cities to rule because obviously he's doing very well at managing resources and people. And one servant has turned his one mina into five. And so he's also a very good manager, but not quite as good of a manager as the one who turned his one into 10. And so the man who turns his one into five is given five cities to rule. Uh, then one servant gives back the one mina. He didn't do anything with it. He claims that he was afraid because his master is too demanding. And so his mina is taken away and is given to the ten mina man. And Jesus seems to tell this parable to explain that his disciples will be held accountable concerning how they manage spiritual matters as they wait for Jesus to return. And so that story is intended to reinforce that truth. We then had Jesus arrive in Bethany, which is a little village on the outskirts of Jerusalem. We dealt with the accusation that Jesus was a horse thief. If you remember that, a nationwide atheist organization based right here in Madison had a rather famous article that was published a number of years ago accusing Jesus of arranging for the theft of a horse. And so we dealt with that accusation a couple months ago, and then we have the Lord's triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem on that colt, where he weeps as the city of Jerusalem comes into view. And in that context, he predicts the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, the siege that would take place 40 years later in 70 AD. In Matthew and Mark, we have him cursing a fig tree on his way into town. And then at the end of Luke 19, we had the second cleansing of the temple as Jesus drives out those who are buying and selling. And I say second because he had done this previously about three years earlier, right near the beginning of his ministry. He's just overwhelmed with zeal. He is angry at what's going on there and he physically drives these money changers out. And he makes them, he forces them to leave. Well, he does that at the beginning of his ministry, and he does it here again at the end. And this happens on Monday of the last week before the crucifixion. Well, tonight we jump over from Luke 19 into Luke 20, and we'll be using the harmony of the Gospels again tonight. I put it on the screen down there if you can see it in case you're interested. The harmony is available on Amazon for usually around $25. And it's basically just the four gospel accounts arranged in four parallel columns, parallel to one another, so we can compare and contrast between the four, so that we have everything arranged in chronological order very neatly, in a way that is arranged in a way that we can understand it. And the harmony, I'll tell you, is especially helpful in the last week of the Lord's life before his crucifixion. We have a lot going on in the four gospel accounts at this point. Most of the book of John 
gets added in here and so the harmony is especially helpful with all of this and what's really helpful is the chart in the back of the harmony on page 349 I think it's the next to the last opening in the book and so it's right there it's even after the the, the index and all of that it's after the appendixes and uh, and all of this and the authors list the event of the last week in chronological order on one page just a summary of the headings along with the section numbers and so it is very very helpful as we go through the last week of the Lord's life in chronological order several things get inserted between Luke 19 and Luke 20 so Luke 19 where we left off two months ago and Luke 20 where we pick up tonight a couple things get inserted here starting with John 12 20 through 50 and that's where a group of Greeks come to Philip that's interesting to me Philip has a Greek name and so they see an opening there maybe he's like us and so they jump in there and and they come to Philip and they say sir we wish to see Jesus maybe you're familiar with that little uh, quote sir we wish to see Jesus most of you don't know this but when my parents first moved to Madison a number of years back dad wanted something to put his songbook on whenever he would lead the singing on a Wednesday night and so it wasn't really appropriate to use the pulpit up front on Wednesday night we feel so disconnected from everybody else if we're standing way up there so dad wanted something and so I built a little pulpit that hooks over the back of the pew some of you may have uh, remember seeing this on a, on a Wednesday evening and so we built something that that hooks over the back of the pews so you could put it halfway back and kind of be where everybody is and very few of you know this but on top of that pulpit I would burned this quote from John 12 21 the quote from the Greeks who came to Philip and they said sir we wish to see Jesus until and, uh, and so on top of that pulpit that's what it says sirs we wish to see Jesus and obviously it is completely yanked out of context <laughs> there's no context on the top of the pulpit there um, but it is a good reminder and so whenever somebody stands behind a pulpit at church the people in the audience want to see Jesus and so that's a reminder to whoever uses that pulpit uh, the people want to see the Lord and so this gets inserted between Luke chapters 19 and 20 that little incident then we also have the reaction to the dead fig tree as I mentioned just briefly before you may remember on his way back into town Jesus curses the fig tree because it didn't have any fruit well as they're going back into town the next morning the Apostles notice that the tree is completely dead it's totally withered so the day before it had a lot of green leaves but no fruit Jesus curses it and now they come back the next day and the tree is dead it is crispy and so Jesus then gives uh, an explanation and he teaches a lesson about prayer when we pray God listens so Luke totally ignores this but that account is found in Matthew and Mark so in chronological order the Greeks asking to see Jesus and the explanation of the dead fig tree get inserted here so I hope this makes sense this brings us up to speed we are now ready tonight for Luke chapter 20 so if you have your Bible I hope you will look at it with me Luke 20 verses 1 through 8 and for those of you who are joining us online we've got it up on the screen there Luke 20 verses 1 through 8 on one of the days while he was still teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel the chief priest and the scribes with the elders confronted him and they spoke saying to him tell us by what authority you are doing these things or who is the one who gave you this authority Jesus answered and said to them I will also ask you a question and you tell me was the baptism of John from heaven or from men they reasoned among themselves saying if we say from heaven he will say why did you not believe him but if we say from men all the people will stone us to death for they are convinced that John was a prophet so they answered that they did not know where it came from and Jesus said to them nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things 
All right, on the timeline, we are now on Tuesday morning of the last week before the crucifixion. And as Jesus is teaching there in the temple in Jerusalem, what happens? Well, the chief priests and the scribes hear Jesus teaching. They see what he's saying there, and they challenge his authority. Basically, the leaders come in, and they're saying, who do you think you are? Who is giving you permission to say things like this. And so they confront Jesus in verse 12. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things or who is the one who gave you this authority. Usually, as I understand it, scribes back then taught almost like somebody would write a term paper today. They would quote others and they would give footnotes. I know today a lot of times as we're preaching, um, at least I don't preach as I'm giving a term paper. I don't give you footnotes and have little you know, according to so-and-so or whatever. But, but usually when rabbis would teach back then, they would say, according to a rabbi so-and-so, this, this, and this. And then according to this other rabbi so-and-so, this, this, and that, and so on. Well, Jesus comes in, and he doesn't teach like this. He is completely different from the teaching style of anybody that they were familiar with listening to. So others didn't teach like this. Jesus was completely different. You may remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that he was teaching them as one having authority, not as one of their scribes. And so the scribes didn't come across as having authority on their own because they were always quoting somebody else. Well, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus was different. He didn't quote others to establish his authority. No, he was his own authority. And so when he shows up teaching like this in the temple, when he comes in turning over tables, being physically violent in this way, the people in charge of the temple, they want to know, who in the world do you think you are? Who gave you permission to do these things? By what authority are you teaching? Who, who do you think you are? Uh, we have this chain of command here in the temple, and you are not in it. And so they're challenging him on his authority. However, instead of giving them a direct answer, notice in this passage that Jesus, as he often does, answers their question with another question. And so he is making them think. And he wants to know, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And by asking this question, he puts them in a very difficult position. They are stuck. And so they confer among themselves. They consult with one another. And I can almost see it happening. A little huddle of the people in charge. They step off to the side and they're kind of whispering to each other and they realize that if they go back out there publicly and admit that John's baptism was from heaven, then they condemn themselves because they never believed John. They weren't baptized with John's baptism themselves. <laughs> they thought John was a renegade. They thought John was a lot like Jesus here. On the other hand, if they admit that John's baptism was from heaven, uh, they condemn themselves because they never really believed him. On the other hand, if they say John was just making stuff up like they really believe that he was from men, then they're in trouble with the crowds because most of the people respected John as a prophet. And so instead of going in one of two very difficult directions, they're in a spot where they can't win here. And so instead of coming down on one side or the other, they take the complete cowardly way out, don't they? And they just refuse to answer. We don't know. We don't know where John got his authority. And so Jesus responds, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So it's not that Jesus was scared to answer, uh, but he was making a point. Everybody with an honest heart would have seen that Jesus is speaking the truth here. And that the chief priests and the scribes, they're the ones who are trying to suppress the truth and they're being dishonest with what the crowd knows to be the truth. Well, at this point, Matthew includes a parable that's only found in Matthew. So right here at this point, we would inject Matthew 21, 28 through 32. And that's a short question about a man who had two sons and asked them to go work in the vineyard. If you remember that, this guy says, okay, sons, please go work in the vineyard today. And if you remember that little short story, one agrees, but didn't go. And the other one said he wouldn't go, but later he changed his mind and he did go work in the vineyard. And Jesus wants to know which of the two did the will of his father. 
and the religious leaders answer correctly the latter, uh, the one who first refused but later went and did the work that the Father requested. And, and Jesus says, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and the harlots will get into the kingdom of God before you people. So that right there is a huge, huge insult. And that's where that gets inserted. It was totally true, but it obviously would have made these people incredibly angry that the tax collectors and the prostitutes would get into the kingdom of heaven before they would. They are more righteous. The, the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are more righteous than these people are. Well, that goes right here. Um, as we look at what happens next here in Luke 20, I want us to think about Jesus as the Lamb of God about to be sacrificed on the Passover on this coming Friday. Uh, back in Exodus 12, leading up to the first Passover, you may remember the people were uh, to take the lamb into their own home on the 10th of the month until it was to be sacrificed on the 14th. And in that time, they were to get to know the lamb. They were to become familiar with it. This was to be personal to them. And basically in that time period, they were to make sure that the lamb was completely perfect. In a sense, that is what is happening here in Luke chapter 20. They don't realize it at the time, but the religious leaders are examining Jesus, trying to find a blemish of some kind before he's sacrificed. And the timing fits. Remember, this is Tuesday. And so they are examining Jesus, doing everything possible to find fault. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. But the examination goes both ways, doesn't it? Because Jesus is also examining them and showing that they, in fact, are the ones who are in need of a sacrifice. So this leads us to the next parable uh, that is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 19. So let's look together at Luke 20, verses 9 through 19. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine grower so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and send him away empty handed. And he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also, and treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty handed. And he proceeded to send a third, and this one also they wounded and cast out. The owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine grower saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. When they heard it, they said, May it never be. But Jesus looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected. This became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, and they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. What an amazing story. And so we have a man planting a vineyard. He rents it out. And the renters refuse to pay the rent by not sharing the produce. It happens, though, doesn't it? This happens sometimes. Sometimes renters don't pay the rent. Often it's because of some financial hardship. Uh, maybe they lose a job. Maybe there is some medical situation. On the other hand, we know there are some renters who refuse to pay, even though they have the ability to pay. I know we've run across people from time to time um, who change apartments every nine or ten months, and they just stay barely ahead of the game, and they're playing the system, moving from one place to another, uh, getting six, seven, eight months behind on rent, and then moving. And then it happens over and over 
and over again. But I want us to notice that what happens here in this story is not a hardship. There's no drought that comes through decimating the vineyard. That's not what goes on here. They have the crops. And so God has been good to them, we might say. There are crops to share. There are crops to pay the landowner. The landowner sends a slave, sends one of his servants to collect, to pick up some of those crops. But the renters, not only do they refuse to pay, but notice in this passage, they beat the slave and send him away empty-handed. So they don't just say, sorry, we don't have it, or we're not paying, but they're actually physically violent. And the same goes for the second and the third. They beat them, they treat them shamefully, they wound, they cast out. That is, they throw them physically violently out of the landowner's own vineyard. This is his property. Uh, they're only borrowing it for a season. Well, as a last resort, the landowner sends his only son. And it's ridiculous, isn't it? That That is not the way this would go down in real life. But this is a story Jesus is telling to make a point. And so in the story, the landowner hopes that they'll respect the son. But of course, as we know, they don't. And instead, they figure that since he's the heir, since he's in line to inherit this vineyard, if they kill him, then they'll inherit the vineyard instead. That's not the way it works, though, does it? Renters do not inherit the house that they're renting if the landowner dies. This is not the way it happens. This is a ridiculous picture. In reality, we see the scribes and the religious leaders in this passage, don't we? It's obvious. It's obvious to everybody listening. They're the renters. They're just borrowing this little piece of land here in Jerusalem, in a sense. But they're the ones making up the rules. They're the ones abusing the prophets. They're the ones who murdered John the Baptist, uh, trying to personally inherit God's kingdom by force. But that's not the way this works. Outwardly, those who hear this parable react with shock. In verse 16, may it never be. Oh, we're fainting. I can't believe this terrible thing is happening. Um, I think of the prophet Nathan telling the story to King David, the story about the rich man stealing his neighbor's pet. David was irate, wasn't he? This man deserves to die. David is about to whip out his sword and, and do it himself. And yet he's also guilty. It was spoken against him. Well, the same thing happens here. Those who are mad are those who are guilty. And so Jesus comes back with this quote from Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief corner stone. By the way, the all caps here is not shouting. I know I pointed that out before. Let's just make sure we're clear on the formatting note. Today, when we see somebody communicating in all caps online, that's the equivalent of shouting. Uh, Jesus is not shouting here. I guess he might be shouting, but uh, that's not the point. This is a formatting note by the translators. Most of us have it formatted in this way. Uh, but this indicates that this is a quotation from the Old Testament. And I would emphasize this is not just some random passage. But Psalm 118 was known as being a psalm about the Messiah. It was a messianic psalm. This was all about the Messiah or the Christ. This is the psalm, the same psalm that the people shouted out as Jesus entered Jerusalem two days earlier on Sunday morning. Back in Luke 19 verse 38 as they quoted from Psalm 118 verse 26. And here Jesus is now quoting it again. And you know the leaders heard it the first time. And you know they were mad about it the first time. And so here he throws it back into this argument. And Jesus is applying it to himself. He's bringing on his own crucifixion in a sense. And so by quoting Psalm 118, Jesus wants them to think about this. Think about this concerning me. He's saying it's the picture of stonemasons constructing a building. Some of us may be aware that uh, the word referring to Jesus as a carpenter. When I think carpenter, I think two by fours and nails and hammers building a house. And that is certainly a, 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 certainly a possibility. That kind of sounds strange, doesn't it? You can't have a certain possibility. But it's a possibility that Jesus was a wood, hammer, and nails kind of carpenter. As I understand it, though, in the Greek language, 
it could also refer to somebody who made things out of stone, a stone mason. So it's possible Jesus worked with wood, but it's also possible he worked with stone. And so there are a couple possibilities there. So I find that interesting. But Jesus is applying this to himself. And it's the picture of stone masons constructing a building. And of course, they have all their building materials laid out. They got this pile of stones that they've collected for this project. And there's this huge kind of awkwardly shaped stone. It's not square, it's not a cube, and so it's kind of hard to work around. And so they set it aside and they think, we'll never, we'll never fit this in. There's no way we could ever use this. And yet as they work on the building, as they get near the end, they finally realize the spot that we have left it was made for this stone that we laid aside at the beginning. And so this rejected stone ends up being something of a keystone. You know, the keystone at the top of an arch that holds everything together. This weirdly shaped stone that we set aside thinking we would never use, that ends up being the most critical stone in this entire project. That's Jesus. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He is the stone that the builders rejected, but he's actually the chief cornerstone. He is the key to everything. Over in Matthew's account, in Matthew 21, 43, Jesus goes on to say, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? God's kingdom will be taken away from these Jewish leaders, the hypocrites, and it will be given to the Gentile people. And in fact, Matthew goes on to say in Matthew 21, 45, and when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. And so there is no doubt whatsoever. And Luke notice says something very similar in verse 19, there at the end, uh, by saying, And the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him at that very hour. And they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. Cowards. Once again, they saw Jesus needed to die. It was just a matter of time. They needed an excuse to do it. They knew they couldn't get away with it here without the people killing them first. Because Jesus was so much respected by the crowd. So that's where we are at Tuesday on the week of the Lord's crucifixion. In Matthew, we have a bonus parable thrown in here that's not found in the other accounts, the parable of the wedding invitations. And that's in Matthew 21, 1 through 14. Uh, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a king who gives a wedding feast for his son. He sends out invitation, invitations, but nobody comes. How embarrassing is that? <laughs> Totally unlikely scenario. Everybody wants to go to the wedding of the king's son. So the king sends out wedding invitations and nobody shows up. So it's a bizarre picture. Um, and so he sends out slaves with a reminder. Remember, my son's wedding, it's right here. And nobody's showing up. Remember, second invitation, nobody cares. Nobody listens. They ignore that invitation. In fact, they even mistreat and kill some of the slaves who deliver the invitation. So it's bizarre to be invited to a wedding feast and to kill the person who gives you the invitation. I mean, at the very least, you get good food out of a wedding, oftentimes. But that's, what ha that's what's going on with Jesus here. He comes with good news, but he's about to be murdered. In fact, just four days later. Uh, in the parable, the king sends out another round of slaves with yet another invitation. Only this time, he tells his servants to invite absolutely everybody. It's not just the guest list. We're opening it up. Now, anybody who's interested, anybody you can find, guys by the side of the road, people passing through town, anybody who wants to come is invited. And then when we find these people, they actually come and attend. The king sees one guy not wearing wedding clothing, and he has him thrown out. And his only explanation is, many are called, but few are chosen. So it's a rather harsh study. Um, especially for those who either reject the invitation or try to come in unprepared. So we're not spending time on that. I'm just showing that that pops up here in chronological order. 
And that then brings us back to Luke. So let's pick up tonight with Luke chapter 20, 20 through 26. I believe this is our last paragraph tonight. So Luke 20, 20 through 26. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could deliver him to the rule and authority of the governor. They questioned him saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly. And you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. And being amazed at his answer, they became silent. So notice in response to these parables Jesus has been telling, the religious leaders are now keeping a very close eye on Jesus. They're even sending spies to try to catch him in something, to try to trick him up, to say something unpopular. And at this point, they're gathering evidence so that they can bring charges before the governor. So uh, they've decided Jesus is going to die. It's just a matter of how and when. We're d we just got to make it happen. We just got to find some way of doing it. These spies seem to be highly educated men who are playing stupid. They're pretending to be righteous. Matthew and Mark both, both tell us that the spies are Pharisees and Herodians. The Herodians, as the name suggests, are those who support King Herod. Uh, today we might imagine a political party that supports a particular president or who supports a particular governor. They are biased. This is our guy. So the Herodians are those who support Herod. They support the rule of Rome in Jerusalem. And what's amazing is the Pharisees and the Herodians are teaming up here. They are now partnering up to get rid of Jesus. The Pharisees hated King Herod. They hate Jesus even more. And so they collaborate with the Herodians. In my mind, I picture Democrats and Republicans getting together on something and being in total unity. When does that happen? <laughs> I can't think of it, at least in recent history. But when it happens, it's a significant issue, isn't it? We think about after 9-11, everybody came together, right? That was a rare event, and I think that helps us to explain what's going on here. The Pharisees and the Herodians are teaming up only because, not because they really agree with each other, but because they hate the Lord so much, they put aside everything else that they disagree with, uh, uh, with each other on. And that, that helps to explain what's going on next. Notice, these men start praising Jesus. You're, you're such a great teacher. So they're trying to lower his defenses. We're on your side. You're, you're a great teacher. Lord. You are impartial. You see the Lord's truth and you teach it no matter what and, and so on. And then only after this praise, they spring it, don't they? Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? What are they doing here? They're setting Jesus up to give an answer that makes either somebody or everybody mad. If he says, yes, pay your taxes. Well, he makes the people mad because nobody likes paying taxes, especially to the Roman government. On the other hand, if he says, nope, nobody needs to be paying taxes. Well, who does he make mad then? Herod, the Romans, everybody. That gives the Romans an excuse to come in here and then the Romans end up executing Jesus and the Jews don't have anything to do with it. They can just step back and watch it happen. So there's no good answer for the Lord to give here, at least as they see it. We've got him. But instead of giving an unpopular answer, Matthew tells us that Jesus perceives their malice. Jesus, knowing their hearts, he can see right through these people and he, he sees what they're doing. He sees it coming. Mark tells us that he knows their hypocrisy. He knows their hypocrisy. He knows our hypocrisy. Luke tells us that he detected their trickery. And so he can see through their fake compliments. Therefore, Jesus turns it back on them. And basically, he has them give an answer. Show me a denarius. 
whose likeness and inscription does it have? They answer, Caesar's. Just a note here, the most devout Jews would have seen the image of Caesar on a coin as being idolatry, the worship of an idol. Remember, I think it was the, the second of the Ten Commandments said, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. And so it's interesting that these people are still able to rustle up a coin right there in the middle of the temple, isn't it? For them, it was a sin to have a graven image of anything. And yet Jesus says, show me a denarius. And these guys are like, oh yeah, uh, right here. Let me see how he exposes them right there. These people trying to make this point whip out a denarius. And so they're violating their own rule right here, right there in the temple. So we have this idolatrous coin uh, with them. So a bit hypocritical for them, uh, but they apparently whip it out. They admit that it has the image of Caesar on it. And Jesus responds, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. I don't know about you, but personally, I've always focused on the Caesar part of this. Since the coin has the image of Caesar on it, ultimately that coin needs to make its way back to Caesar. And that's true. That, that's an awesome point. It, it answers the question. But I've also realized over the last few days that rendering to God the things that are God's is also really important here. And the reason I say that is these people had not really been giving to God the things that are God's, have they? because of the money changing in the temple and through their hypocrisy. These people are cheating God out of the pure, undefiled religion and worship that is rightfully his. And so both parts of Jesus' answer here are truly important, the Caesar part and the God part. The Caesar part takes care of the tax question. The God part nails these people over how they'd been cheating God by not giving him what is rightfully his. Of course, in verse 26, the people are amazed that they're proud that somebody finally stood up to these people. Uh, the leaders have nothing at this point. They've exhausted their, their final option, and they cannot answer, and so they become uh, completely silent at this point. And this brings us to a good place to end tonight. Uh, thank you again for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Make sure to send me any prayer concerns so I can get those in the bulletin. And next week, let's come prepared for our study by reading the rest of Luke chapter 20. So next week, we'll focus on Luke 20, verses 27 through 47. Uh, tonight, let's close by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we have come together tonight to see Jesus. And we're thankful for what we've seen through the eyes of Luke, your servant. We've seen your son demonstrate that your wisdom is truly amazing in every possible way. The stone that the builders rejected is truly the chief cornerstone, the foundation, the critical piece that holds everything together. Thank you for allowing us to study in this way, just as those Roman roads made it possible for the early church to reach out in ways that had never been possible before. So also, we are thankful tonight for the internet as imperfect as it is, and we're thankful for this opportunity. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for making us a part of your family. We come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.